Nearly eight months ago, a man reverse engineered the Google authentication on Bard, Google's ChatGPT alternative. This exploit allowed open source developers like me to create APIs for Google's unreleased Lambda model through Bard. To understand how it all started, how the exploit worked, and how all of this led to my race today to make Google's newest multimodal AI model, Gemini, one of the most powerful AIs ever created, easily available and free to all, we have to start on May 16th, 2023, nearly seven months before Gemini launched. At the time, Google had just released their brand new Bard chatbot, joining a race with OpenAI to create the perfect human replacement. I mean, helper. It was powered under the hood by the Google Lambda model, which was a brand new LLM. And like any good developer, my first thought was to figure out how to get the API so I could build my own AI chatbot and feel like a true developer. But either Google got lazy or just didn't have the time to build one, there was surprisingly no API yet for Lambda. Now, I wasn't particularly desperate to use the API, but the sole fact that there wasn't one made me want one even more. The solution now was to dig into network requests and reverse engineer the entire Bard web Website to figure out how Bard was calling the AI model internally. However, this was but a small obstacle in my way because as a developer who has had years of web development experience, I knew that someone else had already done exactly what I was trying to do on GitHub. Unfortunately, they had done it in Python and as a certified JavaScript addict by GitHub, I knew now it was my job to borrow the code and remake it in JavaScript. And at that moment, the Bard AI NPM package was born. The idea behind reverse engineering Bard created by Antonio Chiang is relatively simple. As a form of an API token, the user has to copy a Google account identifying cookie from their browser console. Then sending in the cookie and the header of a GET request to Bard would make the website think that they were logging into their Google account. Then by combing through the response HTML, we would then extract a verification ID known internally as an SNLM0E that authenticated the actual Lambda API endpoint. Now, by monitoring network requests going in and out of the website, we can find the model's front-end endpoint URL. Finally, to query the chatbot, we would send a post request to that URL with the SNL M0E, proper prompts, and other data in the body, effectively tricking Google into thinking that this was a perfectly normal web request coming in from the UI. Finally, by grabbing the JSON from the response and parsing it, we can get the model's output, all without paying a single cent to Google for the AI request. Originally, the library's interface consisted of a single object which would store all of the authentication, created whenever the library was imported and initialized. This meant that you didn't have to individually create an instance of a Bard class every time, but it also meant that the entire app could only have one authentication. This surely wouldn't become a problem in the future, as Google is definitely known to be a very friendly company with good reputation with people who try to do something that they don't want them to do. To start with the library, you would simply call in it with your cookie, and then go wild with request requests with the ask AI function. Additionally, sending some IDs that the response returns back to the BART API in the post request allows us to continue previous conversations, effectively creating a way to create a chat interface, which was its own class. Now, it would have all happily ended there. A group of random open source developers beat Google at their own AI game by creating an API for a model that was never supposed to have an API. But Google decided to come in and ruin it all by actually writing good code and authentication logic. It all started with request throttling, in which rapid requests, evidently not possible on the web UI, sent directly to the endpoint was rejected. This was a bit concerning, as doing things like running tests and trying to run 100 requests in parallel for fun required this important functionality. After having my GitHub bombarded with issues, as the library was quite popular that then, I decided that it wasn't worth ruining my reputation by having too many open issues, and I decided to redesign the API from the ground up. With assistance from three main developers, as well as many others, I was able able to finish Bard AI v2. The largest change was converting that single object structure into what it always should have been, a system in which users could create classes with multiple cookies. Many suggested that this could have been a workaround for rate throttling if you could use two accounts worth of Bard at once. Looking back, I don't even understand why I had built it so you could only use one instance of Bard but I'd assume I had some smart reason I simply forgot, rather than admitting to an oversight. Through a lot of thinking and collaboration, our small group had taken the basic interface I had originally imagined and created a redesigned API that was both simple for small tasks, but capable when we needed it to be. Consistency was one of the major goals, so every object creation or method call had only two parameters, a main argument and a config JSON. The main argument would be for your cookie key, prompt, and more, while the config would help fine-tune what you wanted to 
library to do. As Bard expanded, more features including image recognition and Google image output were added. And as these third-party APIs like mine grew more powerful update by update, Google was also getting more motivation to write better authentication to prevent them from existing. For one, they started requiring more than just one cookie to simulate a Google account login, but also had that verification cookie cycle out much faster than before. But let's just pause for a moment here and wonder why the system was designed like that in the first place. It seemed like a major security issue if anything, and surely the problem only exists on the BARD website. Or perhaps Google was more careless with our data than we could have thought. Either way, I guess I am quite proud to say that I contributed to helping Google become a bit more secure. But on the other hand, there was a minor issue in which the library simply didn't work for most people now because of the new and improved cookie system. It would be quite an understatement to say that I spent days trying to figure out how to bypass these new regulations, and all the solutions that I found required shady techniques like an external service monitoring and updating cookies. Every time I did find something that works, it probably took Google a few minutes, tops a few hours, to change their authentication measures again. And it's at that point I learned a life lesson. You can never win in a fight against a large company. Unless you happen to be a medical technology company named Masimo and you're going up against a big tech company named Apple. Anyway, like to persevere and determined person I am, I just gave up on the project. But the story doesn't end there. Soon after, Google released their brand new and much more powerful Palm 2 model and provided an API with a key that you could claim on Google Maker Suite. Furthermore, it was surprisingly free for a limited time only, in contrast to what OpenAI and their Microsoft buddies were doing. It all seemed too good to be true if they had just truly offered for free what they had spent months preventing people from doing, an API for BARD. But indeed, there were some major caveats. One large thing that many people don't realize is that though Palm is the model that powers BARD, the actual BARD website uses much more than just the model. For example, when you pass in a prompt to BARD, it first uses Google Search and Google Workspace, if enabled, to collect relevant information, which is then passed to the large language model. This ensures up-to-date and user-specific information, but the actual language model isn't capable of accessing all those things. Additionally, things like images back in the Palm days were passed to Google Lens, which would then send that data back in text again to Palm. This has changed a bit in the Gemini era, but we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Thus, the API that they offered wasn't truly for Bard. It was for Palm, meaning that many of the powerful features that Bard has, importantly image support, were lost. However, I soon found that that wasn't the only problem. The JavaScript API offered on NPM by Google under at Google AI slash generative language was simply terrible. For one, it was mainly built as a common JS module, an old JavaScript module standard that is now considered outdated compared to its successor, ESM. This fact, compounded with simply poor design, made the library extremely verbose and complicated to use. Not only that, the bundle size was giant. At that moment, I realized that I could fix this problem. And in fact, most of the problem had already been fixed for me. The interface that I had for Bard AI could fit perfectly here. And to avoid just making a wrapper over an already bloated NPM library, I turned to Palm's REST API. By simply passing the API key in the URL parameter and data through the body, converting from BARD AI was surprisingly simple. All the major designs still stood, and the library that resulted was nearly 260 times smaller than Google's module while requiring three times less code to make an AI request. For reference, here's what you needed with Google's module compared to the three lines of code needed for my module, Palm API. I had once again beaten Google at their little AI game, but this library never really picked up the way that Bard AI had. Importantly, many people probably just never scrolled down past Google's official API, and though it may be many times worse, it still shined more, probably because it was a first-party library. Additionally, be it much more stable than Bard AI, Palm API still has lost many features. And simply put, I could do nothing about it until the largest AI announcement that Google has ever made happened. Google Gemini was finally a true breakthrough. Not only was it finally capable of competing with GPT-4, the current leading AI model, it was also importantly multimodal. This meant that, unlike previous models like Lambda, Palm 2, and even GPT-3, it was not just trained on text, but images, sound, and even videos, bringing it up to speed with the majority of the features that Palm was missing from Bard. The same day that the Gemini Pro API was released, I knew I had a chance to beat Google at their AI game one final time. If you learned anything from this video, it's probably that Google isn't so good at developing JavaScript APIs, and this time was no different. They had a better library than Palm this time, but it turned out that they still didn't put too much work into it to make it better. 
Though the package size was significantly better and it was slightly less verbose to use, it was still far from optimal. But I could be lazy as well, except with a much more developed interface. It once again pulled out the barred AIB2 code and started reworking it one more time for Gemini. I still had a few tricks on my sleeve though to optimize my Gemini AI packages experience further than anything before. Gemini came in two major models, Gemini Pro and Gemini Pro Vision, in which the former is optimized for text while the latter is optimized for images and other peripheral data. An important optimization I wanted was less reliance on the user to know exactly what was going on under the hood for AI, but rather just be able to have fun working with large language models. Thus, Gemini AI will now automatically select a model depending on what data you pass it. And additionally, through the same capable configuration system in Bard AI and Palm API, you are still able to manually adjust the model if you need to, along with top P, top K, temperature, and many other variables. If you want to play around with Gemini AI yourself, or just try out what you heard a random guy rambling about for the past few minutes on YouTube, simply install with npm i gemini-ai or the equivalent with your favorite package manager. Ensure that the type is set to module in your package.json, to comply with the modern ESM syntax. Finally, go to Google Maker Suite, click Get API Key, and follow the steps to copy your key. Next, import your library, create an instance of Gemini with your key, and call the AI asynchronously with .ask with your prompt. And just like that, you have made a request to one of the most powerful AI models ever created with just three lines of code. For more information and docs, go to github.com slash evanjodev slash gemini dash AI. There's so much to explore, and I hope that this library can open the doors to AI for people just entering the AI world or for people who want to use this in large scale projects. Huge thank you to everyone who has helped out during this journey, from the original system behind Bard AI to anyone who has submitted an issue, suggestion, or even pull request on any of the repos mentioned in this video. None of this would have been possible without you. Finally, I also want to send my appreciation for everyone who has used or will use my Google AI libraries. It means a lot to be part of whatever you're trying to build, and together, let us create a better future through AI. With that, I hope you guys have a great new year, and I'll see you guys in 2024.